And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Somebody shout, Great joy. Which shall be to all people. Notice that, everyone. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Then verse 13, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Somebody shout amen. Let's pray. Father, just bless continually this service as you've already done. Move upon our hearts today. Let us reflect on, on our lives individually. And oh God, that we'll realize that this Savior that has been born, this Savior that's went to the cross and died and rose, that he still lives within our hearts. And that Father, the only reason we're able to live a victorious life and an overcoming life and a blessed life is because of Jesus Christ within us. And for that, we come to celebrate Christmas, this beautiful day. We ask you to bless everyone, change our hearts and minds for the better. And everybody said amen. Now look at your neighbor real quick and say, make room for Jesus. Make room for Jesus. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Can we do what we do every Sunday and put our hands together and give God praise for the word of the living God? Amen. You know, I heard a little story, and I'm just going to tell it real quick. It's not a number 10 joke now. It's about a seven. So just laugh and make me feel good up here. But it was about a man that was full of pride. And uh, any women ever known a man that thought he knew it all? Come on, ladies. All right. And this man was the mayor of New York City. It's a true story. Happened back in the late 70s, Sister Annette. And the kicker was, how many remembers, now I'm going to tell off on us, how many remembers when you used to pull up to a gas station, they would put the gas in for you? Gas attendants. How many remembers when they would wash the windshield? <laughs> how many remembers when they would check to see if you was running low on oil? Come on. I mean, what happened to us now? Now, young people would never know what we're talking about. But they were called gas station attendants. You remember the Texaco? Come on. And, and so, okay, now you're with me. So she put, they pull in this mayor and his wife. They've only been married about three months. They pull into the gas station, and he gets out to go get some water at the fountain. The guy is putting in the gas. Next thing you know, the guy comes, his husband comes back outside. He sees his wife out of the car. He's the mayor. They've just been married. She's talking to a stranger. And she's laughing, cutting up. And all of a sudden, she throws her arms around him and gives him the biggest hug, come on, in New York City. And all of a sudden, they get in the car, and she's smiling from ear to ear. And the husband, he gets, he's prideful. I mean, he's the mayor. He looks over, and he says, well, you sure gave that guy a lot of attention to be a stranger. She said, he's no stranger. He said, really? She said, yes. Yeah. She said, I've known him pretty much a lot of my life. As a matter of fact, I used to date him. He said, you used to date him? He said, yes. She said, as a matter of fact, I almost married him. And all of a sudden, uh, he says, he gets a little smart aleck with her. He said, well, I can see the newspaper now in New York City. Instead of you being named the wife of the mayor of New York, you would be the wife of the gas station attendant. She looked back at him. Grin just a little bit and said, no, if I would have married him, he would have been the mayor. Come on, come on now. That's the number seven. You ladies give each other a high five. Come on, come on, ladies. Yeah, if it wasn't for me, that man would be eating dirt. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Well, it's always good to laugh and uh, be humorous. I want to talk about no vacancy today. I'm not going to keep you long. It's a real simple story, but it's a beautiful story. It's a story that should be continually told upon this earth. Can you say amen? 
I love that verse 7. That's why I'm taking my text. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Now, when they wrapped him in such, from what I've heard in study, the legs and everything and how they would fold, the, and they still do it today, some of them do, it, it uh, shows the child that's born uh, protection. And it's, it's part of their senses when they're first born being wrapped kind of tightly. But she wrapped him and they was in the manger because there was no room for them in the end. Somebody say no room. You see, we have all seen the paintings of the birth of Christ uh, portrayed here in Luke chapter 2. As a matter of fact, when you think of the birth of Christ, uh, you actually see it through human eyes. Uh, I mean, when we see the birth, we always see the painter who's painted uh, Christ. He's, he's there in a beautiful crib. Uh, uh, we also see Mary, and many times she'll be holding him, and the crib will be sitting there. And, 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 and the picture of, of Joseph, he's standing there proud, and, and, and they're there in the uh, stable. And the stable, which was actually a, a hewn-out rock, uh, perhaps in a mountain or, or somewhere near the side of a hill. That, that was the stable. They, they didn't have the kind of barns and places we build today. So you've got to understand the setting was really in a poor uh, area and, and the circumstances that were around it. And, and then in the picture, though, in the natural eye, we always see where Jesus is being held or whatever, and there's a glowing light all around him and uh, the straw uh, that's theirs. It's all clean. There's no smells going on. And I notice there's always a faithful donkey in the picture. I mean, know what I'm talking about. There's always a donkey there. He's always standing there. All the animals are content. The picture we see by the artist is always something that seems almost abnormal when you start thinking about the day and the time that they were in. They didn't have no Motel 6. Leave the light on. Come on, somebody. They, they were in tough times. And then we also notice there's shepherds in some pictures that artists paint. There'll be the shepherds as we read a moment ago. A week ago we talked about the wise men. Somebody said the only reason they were wise is because they followed the star and came to worship the Christ. Come on, say amen. But we'll see them bowing down and offering gifts. And, and, and then we always notice sometimes in some pictures the parents are happy. And they're gleeful. Is that a word? I might have read it somewhere. I mean, they're just happy and they're just, and you should be when a child is born. Uh, God has honored you uh, in, in making your home uh, a house and, and causing it to be a family. But uh, as I begin to look at this peaceful, loving community uh, of the setting of an artist and everything seems like it's just impossible to be at that time where they were, I begin to wonder, is that thing accurate or, or have we probably allowed human, human uh, I don't know, intuition to play into it? Because I don't think the picture uh, we have seen painted by our artists would really bring about what really took place. How many knows what I'm saying right now? Because let me, let me lay a little foreground. It was not a peaceful country at that time. Roman soldiers, come on. Uh, if anything, people were being taxed to death. Does that sound like America in the past? Come on, I think it's getting better. But I mean, they were taxing them to death. There was times of conflict everywhere. Uh, there was chaos going on. And it couldn't have been a place that was clean. Nothing was beautiful uh, as it appears in the picture. And, and here's what we know right now. If we stopped right now, there's a problem with the picture. Look at your neighbor and say, there's a problem with the picture. See, we're going to evaluate the Son of God. Think about it. He leaves the splendor of heaven. We've read in Revelations in your Bible how beautiful heaven is. I mean, street of gold, walls of jasper. Come on. They don't even need electric company there. Come on. The glory of God and Christ light that city up. But I can tell you right now, everything is good. You don't even have a water bill up there. Come on now. And so with all these things going on, you've got to understand that as I see the picture of heaven, the splendor of it, Jesus leaves heaven and he comes to earth and he's not born in the palace where the king is at that time. You remember Herod 
told those wise men, go find him, uh, come back and get me, I'll come and honor him. No, he wanted to kill him, and he did proceed to have the death of all the two-year-olds, I believe, uh, put, put to death in that time. It was a crazy time. I mean, things were chaotic. So here's Jesus leaving the splendor of heaven. He's not in a palace, but God allows him to be put, and I want to use this word, the stench of animals in an outborn mountainside stable, and, and there's no lighting perhaps, but maybe some type of candle. I mean, what are you going to use for light back then? But whatever was going on, it, it just, the picture is different. And I thought to myself, why would God allow this to happen to his son? You wouldn't allow that. Come on. You mothers ought to raise your hand on that. You would want your child taken care of in safety, in a clean, sanitary place. You want nurses. You want a good doctor. You want people to, come on. I mean, everything, they better be qualified if they come in your room. And the one thing you did make sure was you had a good room. Come on now, when you were bearing children. So when I start looking at this, Jesus should not have to have been born in a stable. Now just stay with me. And, and as a, it's not, but, it, but I looked at it from another way. It's not an accident. I really believe that, that though he was born in a stable, stable, I believe that God orchestrated everything that took place. Can you get an amen there? And I believe that, that Jesus deserved the best from people on the earth, but he didn't get it. And so I understand that the Son of God that, that comes from heaven to earth ends up in a stable. The stable, according to the theologians, I had that wrote down, uh, it was the equivalent to a today's dumpster can. Now we have people that drive by and pick up our waste cans. I, I have had one huge dump, dumpster can before near the, the shop where we live. But uh, I can tell you that those things are definitely not clean. And if you go to a business area, you see two or three on the back parking lot. It's, it's not always a clean area. But it, it, that's what theologians said the place he was born was like. You say, Pastor, you really, you're really painting this picture that, that's really derogatory from what we've seen. Yes, I am. Because I want you to understand what God did for you and I. The Bible said God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. One of the first reasons Jesus came to the earth was to forgive us of our sins. Why don't we give him praise for giving us salvation? That's the reason. And, his, and he gave you and I purpose. You have a purpose when you are saved. Even before saved, we just need to find the Christ or allow him to find us. Many people hide from the presence of God or the call of God. But here's what I want to go on to tell you. No matter what's happening, as I begin to look at this and understand, suppose you are the God of creation. Sit in that seat for just a moment. And I want you to analyze this for just a little bit. And you are able, as God, to speak worlds into existence. Come on. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Bible said in Genesis, He spoke into the midst of darkness and chaotic situations. And light, that's what he said, let there be light. And all of creation that he's made, even created man in his own image. So you got to understand, God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah, he said, whom will you compare me to be? I think God is awesome. He's great. He's wonderful. He's more than enough. He's our savior. He's our healer. He's our deliverer. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you, God is awesome. And he said in Isaiah, there's none like me. But let's go further. You see, you've got to see that God has created everything. All power belongs to God. Think about yourself being the God that I'm talking about. In other words, God chooses the time and the place and the manner of his son's birth. Would you have chosen, if you're God and you have all this 
power? Would you have chosen Christ, your son, to be born in a stable? It don't make sense, church. It just don't make sense. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking to myself, what's going on here in this word? What, this story, right? Why would he, God, he could have done anything, and instead, he allowed him to be born in a stable. Well, there was no room in the house. Come on. And God began to give me a revelation as I was studying this the other day. No room in the inn. And as I started reading that more and more, I understand what Matthew 2 and 6 says. And thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not the least, or you are the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people. What would you find in Bethlehem? I believe it was Nathaniel said, is there any good thing that can come out of Nazareth? Nazareth, though he was born in Bethlehem, Nazareth is where he was raised. Kind of like growing up in Belmede. You see, you've got to realize it, it was not a special place. I'm sure it was smaller than Belmede, but what I am trying to, we're relating here. This place was a place most people would not even know about. There was only a few shepherds there, I'm telling you the story. There was a few farmers there was a few merchants in that small little village. It was a Jewish village. It was made famous, as you know we read earlier, that was where King David's hometown was, Bethlehem, Judea. It's amazing how God connects the dots in Bible prophecy. One part of the story, as we read in verse 1, and almost got to his name, there was a, a governor, I guess it was, Caesar Augustus, and he was as far away as Rome, and he was prompted by God. How many believes God can move in the political arena? Let me see your hand. And I'm telling you, it's God that, that, that positions presidents and kings and queens according to the scripture. All power belongeth to God. Come on, give him praise. I feel a hallelujah in the house. All power belongs to God. But here we have this small little town. God picks a small little town. He picks a, a, a stenchy stable. And, and then he allows the innkeeper not to even have room for him. But this Caesar Augustus, look how God orchestrates. How can I get David, or rather Joseph and, and the babe and Mary, back to his hometown? He says they're going to have to go back according to the law, and they're going to have to pay taxes. So they return to the place where they were raised. So here goes Joseph and Mary and them. They're going on a journey. As a matter of fact, I read that journey was around six to seven days. And I want you women to think about this. How many of you women have, bear, have born children? Let me see your hand. Keep them up. Come on, don't be ashamed of it. It's a great uh, award. I would. Be. Now think about this. Can you remember your pregnancy? Can you remember how uh, it, it first started off, everybody was happy? And you were running around calling them, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant. Okay, I get it. And you still have your figure. Come on. I mean, you're still fitting in your clothes. I mean, you are gorgeous. Am I talking to anybody out there? You are gorgeous. I mean, you're the best thing that's ever happened. Come on, to, human, to the human race. And all of a sudden, after a month or two, you start gaining. Now, don't forget, it was you that wanted the ice cream, the bonbons, the chocolate chip cookies. Come on. And, and next thing, and your excuse was, I'm feeding the baby. Remember that one? I'm feeding the baby. Okay. So all of a sudden, it's eight months later. Now it's eight and a half months. I'm talking right now. You are out to here. I mean, you're not walking straight. You're walking like this. And you are headed, uh, uh, probably, I'm thinking, riding on a donkey of all things. It's not a Cadillac. And if you've ever rode a, a, a smooth walking horse, you need a Tennessee walker. Come on. Uh, you don't need a stallion. But, but I'm telling you, I've, I've only, I don't even know if I've ever rode a donkey. I, I've rode a mule. But I'm telling you, it probably wasn't a great journey. In six or seven miles, you're on your way. And all of a sudden, as you get to the town and the city, and it's probably the nighttime. I mean, you're getting there in the evening, I'm, I'm assuming. And every place Joseph goes especially when it gets to the end 
and he walks up to the counter if there was one or he just knocks on the door and the guy comes, the innkeeper says, there's no room in the inn. Started thinking about that. Man, was it that full already? It was, it was during this time people were returning for taxation. Could have been hundreds, thousands coming back. I don't really know. But I do know that God allowed every place to be taken up. I don't know if you've been there before. But I'm just kind of preaching to myself right now. Because I told you a week ago, it seems like when I don't have much, I draw closer to God. Anybody? Come on. And all I'm trying to do is get you to reflect this morning what was happening in the life of Joseph and Mary. It was Mary who told, uh, in, res in respect to the angel, who told her that God said, Mary, you're highly favored and you've been chosen of God to bear this holy child. You shall be conceived by the Holy Ghost. It's a miracle. And she says, according to thy word. <laughs> Oh, man, what a great answer. When you look at Zechariah and Elizabeth, his cousin, John, that was born from, you know, when, when Zechariah was, he started doubting. Then the angel said, all right, for six months, you're not going to talk. And the wife said, hallelujah. <laughs> it wasn't until John was born that God loosened his tongue. And instead of writing words like the last six months, he was able to say, his name shall be called John. Give God praise. Come on, he's, he's a great God. But then we have Mary. She's been traveling. I mean, I've never, I don't know the, I don't know how that works. You ladies know. But I'm just telling you, I can imagine. I remember when, when Sharon was even carrying Darren. I, I remember, man, she, she was on edge sometimes. I mean, if, if I did the wrong thing, look out. And one time I might have kind of smarted off. I can't remember what I said, and wham! Oh, it was in Jesus' name, allow me to bless. And I was thinking, you know, he said lay hands on the sick that recover. But here we are. Now, but she was, she was about ready to give birth, so see, you got to really get into this story to understand what Mary was at. And when she gets there, Joseph is the, is the provider and he's the so-called husband, you know, and maybe not the real father, but he's the earthly father somewhat. And he's there and he's not really providing and she's, here she is. Her name has already been ruined from the townspeople, the religious people who gossiped and talked about her. But she was only doing what God asked her to do. Have you ever been ridiculed, ridiculed and made fun of or shunned or, or maybe ousted because you obeyed the voice of God? Maybe you made a choice in your family. You were not going to go down that road of alcohol or drugs or what have you. You made a stand for Jesus and you said if nobody else will live for him, I'm going to live for him. Him, give him praise in the house. <laughs> All through scripture, you'll hear the angels say to Joseph and Mary and, and different ones at different times, the shepherds and the wife, fear not, fear not. Let me preach a little bit. I don't know who I'm talking to, but we got 2020 coming right up. The year is about to tick out the old one and the new is about to come in. You should not fear what God has planned for you in the future. Come on. I want to tell you right now, you should not be afraid even in this moment of time. Whatever God has planned for your life, everything has been orchestrated by God just like he did here. The wise men showed up at one time. The shepherds were there. The angels sang in the heavens. The angels that came. I'm telling you that God orchestrated from the innkeeper to not have room all the way to the stable. Why? Because God has 
has a purpose and a plan for your life and my life. And if we won't question God, but just trust God, God's going to make a way where there seemeth no way. He's going to change your life. He's going to change your mindset. He's going to turn people around. He's going to open doors. He's going to shut doors. He's going to raise you up. He's going to push you forward. He's with you. He's for you. And he's going to help you. And you ought to give him a praise in the house. There's none like God. He's awesome. Even when we alter his plan for our lives. Yes, you shouldn't have married that individual. But God still worked it out. Yes, you shouldn't have made that left turn in your life and then you wound up in jail. But look where you're at today. God got you out of the prison house. God brought you out of the hospital bed. Come on. God healed that divorce situation. God replaced the bad with the good. He took the evil and made something out of it. Come on, wave at me if you know what I'm talking about. God will take you wherever you're supposed to be. Even when he spoke to Jeremiah and said, before you were born in your mother's womb, I already had a plan for your life. Oh, somebody shout amen. No vacancy. Touch somebody by you and say there was no vacancy. No vacancy. No vacancy. Can't stay here. You can't stay here, Dale. There's no vacancy. So they show up at the innkeeper. And the innkeeper says, there's no vacancy. I thought to myself, was it because Mary was right at birth? I mean, she had the baby right within a few days there from what I understand. I can't even imagine her taking that journey in her condition. I mean, many of you women would have not done that. This, this, lady, this young girl, and I, I really don't know her age, but I, I'm thinking 15, 16, I don't know. Some, I heard somebody say one time 13. I just don't think that's possible. I'm thinking, you know, gave her a little time here to grow up. But the bottom line is, look at the persecution and the name and the ridicule. And then Joseph, who was going to put her away, I mean, he had a name in the town. He was respectable. No doubt a carpentry taught Jesus the carpentry, I'm assuming. But at the same time, he was, he was ready. He couldn't, he couldn't handle it either. And God sent him a word by the angel said, fear not. God had not given you the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Oh, I want to tell you right now, God is always orchestrating your direction for your destiny. As a matter of fact, he said the footsteps of the righteous. Somebody shout, I'm the righteous. The footsteps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. And many times I have to stop and think, but why, God? Why am I going through this? Who am I talking to today? Lord, you know where I'm at. You see what they're saying. You know right where I live. You know what the neighbor did. You know what my husband did. You know what my son did. You know what the boss did. You know, you know, God, why am I in this position? There's reasons, three reasons why God permitted this to happen. But I'm still painting this picture just for a moment. You know, I wrote down... You know, it's not an accident that the earth today is just like it was then. Back then, there was rulers, leaders of that day that ruled with an iron fist, Roman government. When Jesus came and was of age and such, they wanted him to be the king because they thought he had came. The disciples thought he had came to, to be the, the ruler and the governor and he was going to take over and the Roman soldiers would have no authority anymore. But that, that wasn't God's plan. Jesus, as a matter of fact, said in one passage, he said, this king, this world is not my kingdom. Come on. And so now you understand that 
that we're looking at the fact back then the rulers were hateful and they ruled with an iron fist. There was greed. There was wickedness. Everywhere you turn, there was nothing but the murk and the mire of people being deceitful and hateful. And there was murderings and killings and this and that. And it sounds just like today. As a matter of fact, Bible prophecy said one of the ten most known signs before Jesus comes again is going to be violence in the earth as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be like in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Don't got room for God. We don't want him in our government. We don't want him in our schools. And our schools are messed up to the hill. Can I get an amen? I, if I had a child right now, 17, 18, I don't know, ain't, there's no way I would send them to a normal college. It would have to be a Bible college where you get accredited for something. Now I realize you've got to get a two-year degree and all that. But I'm just saying, many of these people that go to some of these colleges are brainwashed when they do everything to tear down the living word of God. I wish I had 10 people that would give God praise for this word today and say, by this word, man shall live. So as I look at it, we're in perilous times. So understand, they needed peace to come to the world back then. They needed joy to come to the world back then. How many believe America and the world could use a little peace and a little joy and a little love? Let's go quickly. I know you've got to go. So I keep thinking about Mary being there. And, and you know, they told me that in that stable in there were what they called the down and outers that that stable it wasn't just those clean looking animals and all no they usually said around the stables of a small town like that you had robbers thieves outcasts rejects <laughs> i thought about that isn't it amazing that god put the greatest gift to humanity not in the palace where the rich and the famous are let me declare to you, had he been born in the palace, not very many people that were poor would have showed up. Number one, they wouldn't let us in. Come on. We don't run in their circles. So he didn't come. No wonder the scripture says he became, he was rich, but he became poor that we might be rich. Come on. See, uh, he paid a debt that, that we owed. He didn't know. <laughs> oh, I'm going to tell you right now. When he came, he came to the lowly. God purposed him. It's amazing when I thought about it. God allowed him to be born in a stable. And really one of the first things I can think about that is humility. He came as a humble man. The Bible says he was acquainted with griefs and sorrows. Come on. <laughs> he was rejected. All through the scripture you can find where they spit upon him, they mocked him, they made fun of him, they tried to kill him many times. But the Bible says everywhere he went, he was doing good. That deserves a hallelujah right there. Everywhere, everywhere. There's not too many people you know and I know that everywhere they go, they're a blessing. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of people wish you and I wouldn't come around sometimes. They don't count us as a blessing. But if you're saved and you have the glory of God within your life, I'm telling you, you're a blessing and you're a light to a dark world. Say amen, church. So can you imagine thieves are around that place? There was really no safety. They had to go to that stable with robbers and thieves. You, you, I'm going to take my wife there? Come on, men. Yeah, God, you... And I'm wondering what's going through Joseph's mind. God, you told me to keep this woman. And then you told her, now we're going to come pay taxes. And they didn't even know God had set that up through the governor. But God set it up to get them in Bethlehem because Bible prophecy said that's where the babe would be born. And all of a sudden, there they are. And I'm thinking, it's Joseph for this man. God, I, this is it. I can't handle no more. I mean, you got me married to a woman and it's not even my baby. Come on, somebody. Now we've traveled six, seven days when a donkey is, and here we are, we don't have nothing. Then I get here, and she's about to have this child. She's miserable, God. 
can only imagine his prayers. And then there's no place to stay. You know, God spoke to me uh, as I read this again last night. And I started crying to myself. And here's why. I've always read this story as, well, that guy named the innkeeper. You know, really, if you look at it in Luke, Jesus tells about an innkeeper. There's a man that came from Jerusalem, the holy city, and he travels down and he falls among thieves. How many remembers that story? A parable. And, and nobody would help him. I mean, he had wound up in a ditch, if I can say that word. The priest passed by, wouldn't help him. Come on. Religious people, Pharisee came by, all pious, had his nice robe on, church guy. Hung around the elite, holier than thou. Didn't have time for anybody else. Had long prayers. But when he saw somebody that had been beaten and stripped, and the Bible said he was half dead, which tells me he was still half alive. Come on, somebody. The devil took his best shot at you, but you're still living. Come on, give yourself a praise offering right there. Come on. But the Bible said that, remember the good Samaritan came and he picked the man up and he, he poured oil into his wounds, a type of healing. The oil of the Holy Spirit, the oil of gladness, the oil of joy, the oil of peace. I'm telling you, we are nothing without the Holy Spirit. Just raise your hand and give him a holy wave. The Holy Spirit. They told Jesus, you're good. He said, there's none good but the Father. What he was saying was, the Father's in me. He said, he said to the disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me love people, it's the Father. If you've seen me be kind to people, it's the Father. If you see me help people, it's the Father. If you see me lay hands on people and they were healed, it's the Father. Come on, somebody. If you see me feed somebody, it's the Father. Huh. Emmanuel. It's what your Bible says. Emmanuel meaning God with us. I'm just amazed today that he would take the time to come. And you and I, we were destined for a place called hell, which really he didn't want anyone to go there. It's for fallen angels of it that were in rebellion. But let me tell you that here he is, the, the stable situation. And God spoke to me and said, you know, the, that man, the good Samaritan, took him to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And here's some of, Here's some finances to take care of him. He said, but if it costs anything else, if you're put out, if it costs anything, if it costs you a little time, if you have to give a little bit of your life, if you have to commit, if, if, you, have to, if you have to be faithful, if you have to take time out of your busy schedule, he said, I'll reward you when I come back for helping for helping this one. And God spoke to me last night. He said, you're talking about a man that you think is working at the innkeeper who said, there's no room for you here. And God said, Lee, Pastor Lee, that's you. That's what he said to me last night. And that if I didn't have anything to say to y'all today, that I'm dropping you the same words the Holy Spirit told me. You are the innkeeper today. It is you that says, I don't have time for God. It is you, when your mother prayed for you, that you get saved and turned around like mine did, that you're even sitting here today, you ought to be dead. 
It is, it is, it is you, the innkeeper, that God showed his grace and his mercy. Oh, yeah, you got a car, you got a house, you got clothes, you got things going on, and yet you're still crowding Jesus out of your life because you allow this to go on in your life. You allow that to go on in your life. You got this in your icebox. You're hanging around that, and you're doing this. And he said, I didn't come and and die on the cross for you to live for yourself. I came that you would be saved and healed and delivered and you would touch the life of somebody else who needed a place. <laughs> Gary, Gary, you're the innkeeper. Ray, you're the innkeeper. Frank, you're the innkeeper. We are the innkeeper. What a revelation. I mean, that might not mean nothing to y'all, but it just it ministers to me. How many times have I told God I don't have time to pray? How many times have I told God, oh, I don't want to go to church? How many times have I said, oh, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. But when I look back where he brought me from and I look at what he's blessed me with, I don't know where you come from, but I know where I came from. I wish I could just get it through to you today. How important it is for you to make the greatest decision of recommitting your life to Christ more than you ever have. Because he loves you that much. See, this is not a boring story. It's not some fable out of a storybook. No, it really happened. I can't imagine I can't, I know you said, I preach your cries to her. Hey, that's okay. I don't need notes to tell this story. I just know what he's done for me. I want you to stand with me right now. Sister Sharon, would you come? I just want you to come. Just you. I want all my musicians. I, I want everybody in the house to just come and stand right here. Come on. We won't be back till the next Sunday. Come on. There's no Wednesday night. I'm not calling nobody out. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. I just want you to gather as a family this morning. You know, you're, you're really not a stranger in God's house. Somebody said, well, if you come back more than once. No. I believe when you, I believe when you come into his presence, you're one of his. You might not be surrendered yet. That's, that's between you and God. See? I don't know how you're going to live or walk or what's going on in your life or what's hidden. What's, I, don't, I don't understand all of it. I don't know why you're in the position you're in right now. I, I really don't know why this young lady came this morning, but she sure blessed me coming. I hope she comes again. I don't know about you, but life is not life without Christ. Yeah, I started to preach a message. What would we do if there was no Christmas? What if Christ would not have come and was born? What if he didn't live 33 years or so and go to a cross and die and resurrect? And oh my God, I can't even think what would happen or what. Imagine we wouldn't be alive right now because. I don't know about you, but I made so many bad decisions in my early 20s there that I know I should have been dead at least five times. Roy, you know what I'm talking about. And if I don't have a present under the tree, our finances have really been running tight. I just want to give glory to God today. I said this last week. Or I don't know if I, you remember, but our hot water heater went out. I, I'm not trying to be funny here. I'm, and it seems like a small thing. Really didn't have the money for it. I went to Home Depot, I think, and charged it. And uh, we got it in. My older son, Brandon, helped me. And I just kept reflecting on the small things. <laughs> Because we had to turn the water off when the thing went out. It was water was coming out of it. That's a small thing. And to me, nothing else 
what her mattered <laughs> at the moment except getting our water turned back on. Here's the water. He said, I'll worship with the water of my word. Whatever's in your life, the word will wash you clean. He came to save us. He gave us purpose. And he also gave us hope of a heaven to gain.